Let's start with the elephant in the room, even though maybe it's not an elephant in the room anymore, but let's talk a little bit about COVID-19 because that's what's on everybody's mind. And, uh, you know, we've heard um, rumors about vaccinations coming down the pipe and they even, I uh, can't remember, I've got it on the second page here, somebody last night, Operation Warp Speed yes. when it comes to the vaccine. So we're looking at, a, at a, the COVID-19, but we want to start out with, with uh, Bobby Kennedy. Uh, what exactly, what happened out in Wuhan that gave rise to all this? Well, nobody really knows what happened. I mean, there was, I, I saw on CNN this morning that, um, I think it was Jake Tapper who was saying, um, there is no connection with the Wuhan lab. And um, clearly, you can't say that. Now, there's very, very strong, I would say circumstantial, but a really strong circumstantial case. I mean, that this um, virus was... Uh, probably what they call went through a uh, process of evolutionary um, acceleration. You know, a lot of people say, well, it's not, it's not engineered. And you could tell if a genetic snippet was attached to the virus, um, virologists could look at it and tell. So it probably was not genetically engineered. There's a process by which vaccines are made called accelerated evolution. They take a virus like the coronavirus that cannot jump to humans, and they put it through, they grow it on, on pangolin tissue, and then they grow it again on, they take what's, what's grown on the pangolin tissue, and they grow it on mouse brains, and then they grow it on feral monkey kidneys. And ultimately, they'll put it in a Petri dish filled with human lung tissue. And in that process, they the... The virus is mutating at a super rate, and it's being taught to adopt to human tissue. Now, why would anybody do that? There's two reasons. You do invent a bioweapon. But the more common reason, and this is something that has been funded by Tony Fauci for years, is to create vaccines. They create a virus that has the capacity to infect humans, to be transmissible, easily transmissible, and super virulent. And they take mice whose DNA or rats whose DNA has been altered to be human DNA. And they, inf- they see if they can infect the rats with that virus. And then once they have done that, they develop a vaccine to protect the rats from the virus, and then they can see if it works. So that's why they make it. Now, Tony Fauci was experimenting with that technology for many years up until 2014. He was doing it at Fort Detrick in Wisconsin and at a lab in um, in North Carolina. And there was a series of mishaps in 2014 where those viruses and some other viruses that were lab-created, lab-generated, escaped from the lab because of poor safety, quality control protocols. There was an outcry by scientists, 200 scientists signed a petition demanding that Fauci stop those experiments. Obama heard heard about it and ordered all the experiments stopped. Instead of stopping those experiments, Fauci transferred the experimentation out of this country, put it offshore into the lab in Wuhan. That laboratory in Wuhan was built by the French, I think, around 2002, and, and it cost them $47 million, and it was supposed to be biosecure. But it, as it turned out, it has a lot of problems, again, with escapees. And we know that the, um, the, the Fauci's experiments continued to occur at that lab. Now, here's one thing that happened. When Trump came into office, there was a division of uh, pandemic security inside the White House. And Trump, in in his cost-cutting efforts, liquidated that department, ended all funding to it. That funding ended on September 30th. And a lot of those scientists who had been working with the coronavirus vaccine, coronavirus um, enhanced transmissible, human transmissible viruses in the Wuhan lab, their jobs were terminated on September 30th. And it it is possible that when they were actually fired, and when they lost their jobs, it is a hypothesis that it, it would have been an advantage
damage to those scientists to maybe release this virus because their jobs would be restored. We don't know. This is complete rumor. It's complete speculation. But the timelines are there. So, um, and this is something, you know, I can't say this happened. Nobody on this call can say that this has happened, but nobody can say it didn't happen. And there's a tremendous amount of evidence that for whatever reason that this did come from the lab. As it turns out, the Wuhan wet market did not sell bats, as has been claimed. Oh, it's, it's, uh, it, you cannot simply dismiss this, and we need to have a real investigation. We can't have CNN simply declaring it didn't happen. It's not credible. We need, this needs to be investigated, and we need specifically to know whether Tony Fauci, who we've entrusted with our salvation during this crisis, was actually played a role in, um, in precipitating the crisis in the first place. Uh, I'd like to... Uh... Just add a little bit to what Bobby said, and I know Dr. Mikowitz is going to have a lot to add, but the one thing is that these gain-of-function studies that were essentially the moratorium that the government passed in 2014 was against chimeric research. And for those that don't know what chimeric research is, is basically where they morphologically change the structure of whatever the, the, the uh, pathogen is. And so they take basically, it's, it's like creating a Frankenstein version. And there's, it's more resistant, it's more virulent. And when you ask the question, why would anybody take a naturally occurring wild type virus and then make it more virulent, make it more resistant, make it more powerful, infuse it with what they call gain of function, basically making it more damaging. Why would they do that? The the response is so that we can study the potential for pandemic and then use that potential to prioritize where research should be focused in on. Now, this is, Judy, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the essential mandate and this is essentially the, the thought process of those who are promoting the gain of function within the virological community. And there were many, there were many virologists, as uh, Bobby said, that were against this and, and there was an outcry that prevented it. But this chimeric research aspect to actually do research on something and put it through the gain of function in order to prioritize which one we should study seems like utter madness to me. It's, you know, it would seem like that if we want to really understand which things we should be prioritizing, let's not make it more virulent and more resistant and more damaging. Let's just stay away from there because, you know, it, it's, um, it's just insanity. It doesn't make any sense. It's like, let's build a big fire and burn everything down then to see which area has the most potential of, of being damaged by fire. But let's burn the full forest down to determine that. It doesn't make any sense. I can entirely agree. Firstly, I was fascinated, Bobby, by the comment about the idea that some disgruntled employee from Wuhan who'd just been sacked might do such a thing. And that's exactly what happened, if you remember, with anthrax. Anthrax. When anthrax yeah. was threatened, anthrax research was threatened, vaccines were threatened. Then a disgruntled, disenchanted, disenfranchised researcher released anthrax. And um, it will happen. It will happen. And the question might be that when um, Trump withdrew that funding from the Wuhan lab, uh, did Tony Fauci actually inform him that this work had been going on there, that these gain of function altered, highly virulent, human infecting coronaviruses were being generated in that lab and therefore he should be aware of it in light of the fact that the people who were about to lose their jobs were employed producing such a thing and that would be a very important question i think to pose to dr fauci i think one of the things that rashi's picked up on is that this kind of research should never be done that it was protested against it was stopped it should never be done it reminds me of jurassic park when they're in the lab and the, the egg is hatching and Sam Mendes says you've bred a velociraptor and the, the, uh, the Asian scientist says don't worry they're all female they can't reproduce and Jeff Goldblum the chaos theory mathematician leans in and says you don't understand nature will find a way and that's exactly what happens and they will escape and they will get out this is proof of that if that turns out to be the case what Bobby said is correct then that is what's happened and it's a disaster and it will happen again if people continue this kind of abhorrent science it will happen again it will happen again this is 
Judy, uh, and one of the things um, to, to add to what Bobby was saying, so that that Vero E6 cell line that was originally, it says right in the 2015 Nature Med paper about the emergence, that cell line continuously growing to grow up large amounts of this virus is deficient in the type 1 interferon alpha pathways. So that's why it supports the growth of these viruses. And back in 1999, I did the research saying I uh, did research in the Fort Detrick U. Samrit facility, and my job was to find a cell line that um, that Ebola could infect without killing, so that we could study the virus theoretically. And I was told I'm, I might have been 30, um, a little older maybe, uh, and I was I was told what I was doing was understanding the difference between the highly pathogenic um, Zaire strain and the uh, non-pathogenic Reston Virginia strain. So this is, um, you know, that research at the time, you think you're doing good, but what we knew at the, and, and what we knew in 2014 is that the contagious, that is one that you could aerosolize and cough, Ebola virus that previously was only infectious in blood and body fluid, in fact, um, um, had 300 mutations, was now contagious, killed 21,000 or so Liberians in 2014, um, and, and clearly had 300 different mutations just from passaging, as, as Bobby said, accelerating the viral evolution by growing it over and over in this immune deficient cell line, particularly the type of immunity that does the first silencing of RNA viruses. So, it, you know, uh, I'm, you know, we we knew this thing could happen, and that's why virologists um, and and those among my colleagues were saying this should never be done again, and it was stopped in 2014 because it's a gain of function even if you don't do um, any. Chimera, it's, it's called pseudotyping in molecular virology. That's you put a different body on the that helmet on the guts of different viruses and, and allow them to infect other cells. But you don't have to do that if you passage it through these Vero monkey kidney cells that have simian 40 viruses, retroviruses like Mays and Pfizer monkey virus uh, that are very deadly um, to the spleen. And we see some of that in what we're seeing in COVID-19. We're seeing splenomegalies, we're seeing cytopenias killing of cells that, that suggest that, and we know they were made in this cell line, and we know those can be passengers and carriers that make that more virulent, and it's going to be in the mix because it's not a purified virus. Well, well, you see, so when you're doing it through tissues and not cell lines, continuously growing cell lines, we've learned. Um, and, and that's, it's funny because that's what I've done my whole life. Just, just try to immortalize or transform, make it grow outside the normal tissue because of all the immune responses. So for instance, in 2009, when we isolated, you have to isolate a virus that's not growing very fast in a tissue that has a lot of immune function. So when you, when you find a cell line, this is how we grew the XMRVs. We grew it in a cell line called LNCAP, lymph node cancer patient. It was a, a, a 62 year old man who had um, who had an aggressive prostate cancer, and this virus family was first associated with uh, prostate cancer in people that didn't have a degradation enzyme, a, a Pac-Man enzyme called RNA cell. So that's the whole subject of our first book and how we found this in in families with. Other in families with other cancers, autism, chronic fatigue syndrome. So it's the immune compromise. So in order for these cells, the cell lines, to grow outside the lab and see they're not tissues, they're continuously, continuously growing cell lines that you can grow up in a ferment 
and, and they're, they're lacking. LNCAP was lacking an RNA cell and it was still hormone responsive. So you could drive growth factors. So it's really fascinating when we learn what about the molecular. So we knew Vero E6. So I went in there knowing what Vero E6 was with respect to HIV AIDS and SIV coming from that. And the reason you can propagate it and grow it to high numbers is because the cell lines are immune compromised. That That's an immortalization or a transformation, making them a can cancer, making them grow outside the body. They will only grow several passages if you take a, a primary cell. And the reason you can propagate it and grow it to high numbers is because the cell lines are immune compromised. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to say something about that because uh, this is kind of a logical fallacy in the whole quarantine. Again, I'll go back to CNN. They keep saying, well, Donald Trump should do what the science says. The problem with that is the scientist they're talking to is Tony Fauci, who's a neurologist. So Tony Fauci theoretically can tell you the best way how many people are going to die from coronavirus at each given scenario and the optimal way of minimizing those deaths. He has, as a statistician, as a virologist, he has the training to do that. He does not have the training to do a risk assessment of the quarantine, which is what Ajit was talking about. He cannot tell us how many people the quarantine is going to kill. He can tell us how many people the coronavirus is going to kill. There's very, very good data that show that it is decades and decades old. It is universally accepted, non-controversial. It says that every one point in unemployment adds about 37,000 deaths. Wow. So those deaths come from suicide. Um, about 900 come from suicide, about um, 9,000 um, come from uh, from heart attacks, uh, they come from stress, they, and in addition to that, there's about 4,000 extra additional people for every point in unemployment who go to prison, about 3,300 who go to mental hospitals. This uh, the, the book that did these very, very comprehensive analysis which was written in 1982. You, so you can almost double those numbers because the population has increased since then. So if you, we're, we're looking at now 30 additional points in unemployment. We're gonna go from a 3.5 to um, uh, unemployment to a 35 unemployment, only greater than the Great Depression. And what that means, if you multiply 30 times 37,000 is about 1.1 million. So the worst outcomes for coronavirus are now about 74,000. You know, the, the very worst case scenario is around 100,000. Well, this is 10 times the number of people who will be killed by the quarantine. And that's just from unemployment. The, it doesn't consider the other thing, the other parts of this quarantine, the disruption of the supply chain for medications, the disruption of the supply chain for food and food production, the delayed non-emergency medical care for cancers, for hypertension, diabetes, diabetes that's going to kill a lot of people. Nobody has done that risk assessment. And when CNN says, you know, we need to follow what the scientists say, they're only asking one scientist, and he's a virologist, and he has no capacity to make a risk assessment of what unemployment and quarantine and disrupted food supplies will do to death, to death mortality, and morbidity data nationwide. And that is a critical question that has to be answered before we adopt a policy that is as cataclysmic as putting everybody out of work in this country for three or four months. You know, guys, I just wanted to add, uh, Ty and I, we have a, a really nice guy that comes and works on our air conditioning. And so we opening it up for the summer and getting it all clean and everything. And so he comes into our house to, to what you're saying, Bobby, and um, the panel here. He comes into our house and he shakes and extends his hand to shake his hand. And he, he said, wow, you're going to shake my hand. 
And he and Chai said, yeah, why not? And so they got into the COVID and, and, and they were talking a lot about the things that we're talking about here, uh, the, the pan, pandemic and the quarantine. And is this warranted? And what is quarantine anyways? I, I think that in the past, quarantine was you put people that are sick in a safe place, but now we're quarantining well people, Lots which really people. does not make sense. So we got into that uh, with uh, this friend of ours. And so the friend has a best friend that is right here in our hometown. And many of you have been to our house, so you know where we live. And um, the, his best friend uh, contracted COVID-19 and he got well. And Judy, I think I was talking to you about this the other day. So the, the, um, the man got well, completely better, And he's a local contractor coming to people's homes and helping them with various items in their house. And right now he cannot get work because the locals think that he's a leper almost, that if they get around him, they're going to get this dreaded, terrible disease. When in reality, we know there's a lot we can do. Dr. Buttar just shared some of the things that we can do to, to treat it successfully. We're seeing a high success rate with various treatments. But there's this perception that COVID equals death, kind of like what we talk about with cancer. Cancer, when you don't know the truth, you feel like, oh, okay, we're going to die. And that's just not the truth. So um, the man that couldn't get work, he, he doesn't have a family. His parents have been deceased. And he's been forsaken by all of his friends except for this one friend. And he killed himself. Hmm. He killed himself because he couldn't get work, he had no money, he had no fellowship with people because he's been isolated and nobody wants to get around him because they fear what he had that he's recovered from, the COVID-19. So the safest that's person to be many, around. Yeah, yeah, it's one of many examples of what Bobby is saying is absolutely right. Uh, the, the quarantine from, from what we're seeing is causing a lot more damage, not only economically, not only financially and the destruction really of our economy, not only ours, but worldwide, it's shocking. Uh, but the lives, these people, every one are so precious. You and know, I said, I said, we're looking at fear. I mm-hmm. said when this very first started, basically the first week when they started talking about quarantines and shutting everything down, I said, this has nothing to do with this great big, this big fat nothing burger virus that you just watch, mark my words, it's going to turn out to be like that which is that whole article that I wrote on Baxter of, you know, same playbook, different virus. You know, this is the same time we've done it. This is economic warfare. And the more this goes on, I mean, our governor just said today, today, we were supposed to open up today, May 1st here in Ohio. Oh, no, we're going to do this for another 30 days. And I just said, we're toast. The whole state, 9.7 million people, we're done. 